Well, we've been reading through the book of Luke and the book of Acts, and I'm going to go backwards a little bit today into the seventh chapter, which we read as responsive reading early, uh, early in the uh, service. I want to talk to you about the question that John the Baptist asked Jesus. We don't talk a lot about John the Baptist. You don't hear very many sermons about John the Baptist. Uh, we know he's in the New Testament, that he was related somehow to Jesus' uh, family. But we don't talk a lot about him. But in the New Testament, he is a very important character, and he's pivotal. In fact, in one place, he's likened to the best man at a wedding. Luke begins his gospel with an announcement about the birth of John the Baptist and mentions him several times throughout his gospel, and not only in his gospel, but also in the book of Acts. John was very important in the first century church. In fact, many of the writers in the early days of the church distinguish his words and work from those of Jesus, not in order to put down and dishonor John the Baptist, but to reserve, of course, the highest honor for the Lord Jesus. In this light, the Eastern Orthodox Church doesn't always refer to John with the same title that we know him as, the Baptist, but often calls him John the Forerunner. So in the West, we thank him mostly for the sacrament that he introduces to the church, while in the East, they think of him in the historic role that he played. But however we imagine John the Baptist, whether we call him the Baptist or the Forerunner, he carried whatever he carried out, this important task. He was not only important to the early disciples, he was uh, important to the Lord Jesus because it's no small thing for the Lord to have said of him, no one that has ever been born of woman is greater than he. John's message was about repentance and he preached to people that if they had a covenant with God, they should act like they had a covenant with God. It didn't impress him if a person was an Israelite but didn't live in a way, any way different than the heathen around him. And his ministry was successful for a season. Many of the Jewish leaders walked all the way from Jerusalem to, Jer- uh, to, Jer- to Jordan to be baptized by him, which is no small thing. It's a long and arduous journey. I've done it by bus, and, and uh, it's amazing that they would walk that far. Baptism had been an initiation rite for women who wanted to convert to Judaism. So by accepting baptism, the Jewish leaders were demonstrating their their acceptance of John's accusation that they had not been living like children of covenant. And all this attention came to an abrupt end when Herod had John arrested for speaking out against the king's immorality. So John remained in prison until that fateful evening when Herod was hosting a wild party and asked the daughter of the woman that he had been living with to dance. Her name was Salome, and, and uh, her dance has become famous in history because the king was so smitten when he saw her dance that he said, I'll give you anything, whatever you ask for just right now, which tells us she was not dancing a square dance. <laughs> square dances are nice, but they rarely provoke that kind of uh, reaction, especially from old lecherous kings. Well, so, uh, Salome had been prepared for this. Her mom had... Uh, you know, she knew how, uh, you know, the old monarch would uh, react, and she was out for revenge. And so John the Baptist's days had been numbered ever since he had called her out in her sin. And so Salome responded that she wanted the head of John the Baptist on a platter. That's how the mighty man of God, the one Jesus said was the greatest born of woman, was beheaded by an old man intoxicated by a young girl's dance. Not a very dignified way to go. And we would expect something a little bit more honoring to the man who was the forerunner, the man who came in the spirit of Elijah, the one who once humbly had said, I must decrease, but he must increase. But there it is. There's the pen that burst the bubble of heresies like the prosperity gospel, because as it turns out, even God's choice vessels often go through great suffering and indignities. And may I add doubt. Because many of the great spiritual leaders throughout history and in the Bible itself, most great spiritual leaders, including biblical ones, have struggled at times with their faith. John the Baptist certainly struggled with his faith in the final uh, weeks he was on this earth, sitting in prison, nasty, uh, rat-infested, feces-covered hellhole that the ancient world thought was normal treatment for criminals. John had doubts, and we know that. 
because uh, of the question that he asked Jesus. It was the most important question of his life and is the most, in question, uh, most important question perhaps of anybody's life. Are you he or should we look for another? And behind that question are many other questions like, if I'm the Lord's servant, why am I in this mess? Or if God is great and powerful and loves me and I'm doing his work, why didn't he come and deliver me? Why is Herod winning? This selfish, power-hungry, idolatrous, traitor, lecherous old man, why is he winning? Why is he calling the shots while I wallow in this filthy hole? Am I wrong about the God I serve or have I made some kind of mistake that's made God unhappy with me? Am I utterly wrong in the way that I have chosen uh, to serve God? What's going on here? And let me tell you something. This is, uh, uh, this is a que- question that sooner or later, if you grow in your faith, you must struggle with. I've struggled with them for sure. I can tell you, I have, I have gone uh, th- uh, to graduate school tr- uh, twice now trying to get different uh, uh, callings in life, and the Lord lets me go through graduate school but doesn't let me move to another kind of work. But I can tell you something. Church work will, will quickly disinvest you with a romantic notion that Christians are all kind, upright, and loving people. <laughs> and I, I can tell you, as I've gone, if I've, I've, I've gone through school, and I've, I've, you know, I've just, that's my profession as being a student, I think. But, I, but the thing about it is, is I've, I have faced some of the most powerful, thought-provoking arguments against the faith, and they have never shaken my faith in Christ, but church people have. Because I ask, if we're not changed by the grace and the power of God, this may be a crock. Well, no, 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 it's not the arguments of the heathen that shake, that shake people's faith in God. It's, it's, not, it's not the wolfishness of the wolves, it's the wolfishness of the sheep that shake the heathen. So if you're in God's work, sooner or later, you've got to ask yourself, what am I in this for? And that's what John the Baptist is doing, and he sends his, uh, his disciples to ask Jesus the question, are you Messiah or not? And when Jesus heard the, the, the question, he didn't say, who does he think he is? He didn't rail against John the Baptist. He didn't lash out with some great powerful defense of his ministry. He just says, tell John this. Tell him what you see. You tell him that the deaf hear, the blind see, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. For some reason, Jesus thought that John the Baptist would be comforted by these words and would understand what he was saying. And so, we must assume that Jesus was giving John an answer John would understand. That the things that Jesus mentioned when he tells him this would be sufficient signs of the kingdom of God. That the deaf hear, the blind see, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Is that it? Is that it? Is that the signs of the kingdom? Jesus doesn't say, go tell John my theology is solid and dependably orthodox. He doesn't say, tell John we have 5,000 people in attendance every week. If that doesn't convince him, I don't know what will. He didn't say, tell John we're electing our people to serve in the Sanhedrin, and soon we're going to have enough of a majority in the legislature to make people behave like they should. He didn't say any of those things. He said simply, the deaf hear the blind see, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. These being the signs of the kingdom of God according to Jesus, what are we going to say about our modern churches and denominations? When we look to our religious organizations, do we see the signs of healing and compassion at the core of the operation? Well, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. As John the Baptist's disciples were walking away. Jesus says, uh, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Jesus says in another place that from all the prophets until John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence. How many messengers of peace have ended their lives at the hands of violent people, including violent religious people? John the Baptist isn't an anomaly. All through history and every culture, peaceful men and women have suffered for the words they preach and for the lives that they have lived. We're not different from them, and we're not different from their persecutors. We too often fall for powerful people of the world who grab and conquer, who invite us into the corridors of power. 
Every one of us finds people like that attractive. Who wants to side with the poor or the addicted or the sick? When one can knows that if he plays his cards right, he could be invite, invited to Herod's house. Who wouldn't rather drink fine wine with Herod than sit in mud and feces with a loser like John the Baptist? Sometimes not even John the Baptist wants to be in the role he has. And that seems evident by the question. He's not unlike Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, you know, once famously said that he, he wouldn't preach anymore if they would just get him out of the hole he was in. It was a literal hole in the ground that had once been under an outhouse. And the prophet had been lowered into the gunk up to his armpits. So like the King James Version said he was in the mire. You know what the mire is? It's crap. <laughs> and that gets old quick when you're in that stuff up to your armpit. I'm not going to ask how many of you ever been there up to your armpits. And Jeremiah was ready to, I know some of you upset because I said that in the pulpit. That's the point you'll get of the message. God bless you, you know. <laughs> serve God in peace the rest of your life and have a good day. But Jeremiah was ready to promise anything to get out of that stuff. Have you been there? And when he got out, it wasn't very long till he said, I've got to break my promise because it's like fire shut up in my bones. And that's where John the Baptist is. And, and that's uh, when he comes to ask Jesus the question or sends his friends to ask a question. Are you the one that should come or should we look for another? And Jesus follows up his words to John the Baptist with the warning for us, for all of his followers, to be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, who are they? They are two powerful groups of religious people, legalist on one hand and rationalist on the other. One group wants to control you with rules and the other wants to sneer at your piety. One denies the power of God, one denies the love of God. Beware, Jesus said, of both of them. Why in this context does Jesus say such a thing? And what does it do, have to do with the gospel? Because each of these groups in their own way equally obscure, distort, and alter the message we are called to preach. And both of them rob the gospel of its power. So we can ask, if, if not rules, how can we become holy? Without the favor of important people in society, how can we do our work? How in God's name does it make sense to heal the sick and preach the gospel to the poor? Let us be reasonable. Let's put our cards right here on the table and say, ask this question because people ask it anyway. How can the poor financially support the work of God? How? What do the sick have to offer anybody? No, what we need are famous athletes and celebrities to draw people in. We need to shape our appeal to those with power and resources required to do God's work. That must be what we're supposed to do because that's exactly what's, what's been happening to build successful churches in our country. But just ask yourself this question. What kind of kingdom effects has this approach had? In this wonderful area of the country in which we live, the gospel has been preached for over 200 years. We're proud to refer to our country as a Christian nation, and yet we continually glorify violence as a form of entertainment. We hardly bat an eye to, to hear that we have murder rates that would shame the, most of the other nations. In this state where perhaps as many people go to church each Sunday as anywhere in the world, huge percentages of our population can barely read. Addictions of all kind, legal and illegal, oppress great numbers. The gap between the haves and the have-nots seem not to bother us, and we create theological justifications for maintaining this status quo. Can't we ask of our churches in this, uh, in this kind of scene, are you the representatives of Jesus or are you not? Or should we look elsewhere? And if, if these churches represent Jesus, including ours, we can't accept the answer like we have great facilities or we have excellent music or we have the best programs in town. No. We want to hear somebody say somewhere, come see for yourself. The deaf hear, the blind see, and the, gospel, the poor have the gospel preached to them. 
Then it, you might think it's unreasonable to believe these are supposed to be enduring signs of the kingdom of God, except we have historical records of times and places where these very signs have erupted and entire societies have been transformed by the powerful intervention of the Almighty God. And I could mention all kinds of them, but I'm going to mention one. I did this one for a retreat for economists. This is about, I've, for four times now, I've been asked to speak at conferences of economists. I just can't believe it. I've got to tell you something funny. I, I, was going, I was going to, it was a conference that was surrounding the, the works of uh, the uh, Austrian economist uh, 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 Friedrich Hayek. And uh, so I, I told them, I said, I, I, was, I, I needed to brush up on all the things that Frederick Hayek said. So I went on the web and I've been reading this stuff, but I said, the picture of Selma Hayek keeps coming up. And I said, I, I just like Frederick Hayek, Selma Hayek. And these economists shocked me by shouting out, you know, uh, uh, you know go, go with um, Selma. Uh, my wife wasn't one of those voices, but nonetheless... Um, it tells you the economists do have a life other than just crunching numbers. But anyway, I, I, was, uh, I was speaking at one of these uh, uh, groups not long ago, and, and, and I gave this as, a, as part of my presentation. A few years ago, the English aristocracy trembled from the news at France. Dukes were being decapitated and the wealthy despoiled of their goods. The poor were rioting. France was wallowing in anarchy. What would keep the same thing from occurring in England where conditions were similar? In England, too, the poor shivered in the cold as ladies danced at balls and bishops discussed philosophy at Oxford. In England, as in France, the class divide had become unsustainable. The wealthy didn't have enough money to hire enough soldiers or build high enough walls to keep out the people who were hungry and growing desperate. Catastrophe was coming, and the aristocrats knew it. They just didn't know when. And then something happened unexpectedly happened. An Oxford doctor of theology went to a prayer meeting where he experienced the presence of God and gradually he embraced a call to preach the gospel to England's poor. In time, coal miners and farmers and street vendors and orphans were crowding to hear John Wesley preach and sing and, and to sing Charles Wesley's song. In a few years, 20% of England's population became Methodists and like John and Charles, they too experienced the presence of God. The social lift that comes with understanding the gospel, the intellectually transforming energy that comes from wrestling with Holy Scripture, they experienced this. Wesley preached a gospel of hope. He encouraged poor people not to remain where they were, and he gave them a ramp upon which they could walk out of their poverty and ignorance and into dignity and productivity. Wesley loved the poor people as they were, but he loved them too much to leave them where they were. We must pay attention to this history. George Barna recently noted that the poor are the most unchurched group in American society. And that this is particularly true of poor English-speaking whites. His research shows that white poor people are actually falling away from the church in great numbers. In the younger generation, the, stati the statistics become even more alarming. A recent edition of Time magazine focused on the accelerating pace at which American culture is shrinking its middle class. There are many factors to blame, not the least of which is a native working force now largely of uneducated and unskilled compared to that of other industrialized nations. In other words, too large a proportion of our middle class young adults do not know the basics of Western civilization. They can't read at adequate levels. They don't know geography. They have inadequate math skills. They're not aware of the basic scientific discoveries of the last many decades. And for all these reasons, American workers are having an increasingly difficult time competing with their Polish, English, Spanish, Russian, Indian, Korean, and Brazilian counterparts in a globalized economy. Corporations can often get more for their money elsewhere. America's poor need a ramp to climb out of these challenging circumstances. And here's what I said to this Congress of, of, of Economists. The situation is a spiritual one. Although at present few of our churches are offering it because too many of them are too focused on lesser things. That was also true in Wesley's day. The Church of England was about doing well instead of about becoming good. The rabble was staying away from church because there was nothing there for them. The English church had become a bastion of the status quo. And the only alternative 
visible to the English church leaders was a French-style revolution which many were prepared to fight for the death. And then came a God-sized solution and with it a massive economic rebirth for Great Britain in which all classes of society ultimately participated and from which all ultimately benefited. Wesley's message was good news to the poor because for the first time in their lives they had no hurdle to jump. They could get into the club simply because they breathed air. Each generation of Methodists could walk up another rung of Wesley's ramp to ever higher levels of virtue and knowledge and skill and that's why the French Revolution never reached England. Jesus got there first. He arrived through committed and informed believers who dedicated themselves to serving others in his name. The aristocracy sneered at the Methodists. They kept enjoying their port and cigars as their humble neighbors become citizens of another world. But their poor neighbors no longer cared. They had forgotten how to view themselves as poor. And they did not view their neighbors as rich anymore. They saw them as lost. They no longer hated their lost and wealthy neighbors. They had pity on them and preached to the upper classes the same gospel that had liberated them. The Methodists won the class war by simply ignoring it. They were too busy flourishing to give it much thought. The Methodist revival not only saved souls and inflamed people's emotions, it left lasting contributions to the world in the form of hospitals and universities and orphanages. It gave us the Salvation Army and Pentecostalism. It evangelized our own country so that by 1950 there were more Methodist churches in America than post offices. Church growth that lacks these components of transformation and healing fails the Lord's test for representing the kingdom of God. The message that Luke presents in both his gospel and in the book of Acts is this. The kingdom of God is an exorcism. It is a deliverance of individuals and communities from the power of evil. And it comes as people are dedicated to healing the sick and bringing hope to the poor. Now, let me tell you something. God is at work healing the poor through the mechanisms of, of, of the medical arts. Many of you are nurses and doctors and laboratory techs and all of that working at the hospitals and clinics and all of that. You are doing God's work to bring healing uh, to, to the sick. And also, those of you that work in taking uh, the material needs that the poor need so that they can have things to eat, things to drink, they can, have, uh, uh, they can have warm clothing and so forth, that's doing God's work. All of that is wonderful and vital to a society. But let me tell you something else. If you want to transform a community so that you're not just constantly working at putting out fires, there has to be some church somewhere that represents the kingdom of God in such a way that the people are delivered by the power of God. Their addictions fall away. Their mental diseases are healed. They have a community to belong to. This, the power of God, is what breaks the yoke and makes a permanent difference in a community. Only the power of God. And that's why I feel sometimes that I'm in the middle of a highway and all the leaders of the American church are going in the other direction and they're going toward a cliff and I'm saying, you're going the wrong way. The right way to bring in people into Jesus Christ is not catering to the world and, and feeding us with the same stuff we get into the world. We don't need the same stuff that we get in a bank, in a shopping mall, in a concert. We need something different, other, that pulls us into eternity, makes us aware that Jesus has risen from the dead, and we go out of that place convinced, utterly convinced, we have been armed with the power of the Holy Spirit to break the yoke and the chains of darkness that bind people. We've got to have that for to be really a church that represents Jesus Christ. The 
The kingdom of God comes to those who are bound with a power that flows from compassion rather than from a desire to aggrandize either minister or institution. I'm not talking about these kind of Elmer, Elmer Gantry kind of types that just make, just fly around the world jet setting in the name of healing people. That's, that's a crock as well. Aren't you tired of all that stuff? I'm talking about normal people like me and you going out in the name of the Lord say, let me pray for you and watching God do what God does. And it's about shining light in a dark place, even when the guardians of darkness object and react violently, which they often do, both in the church and out of the church. So I tell you, if we walk this path, there will be hardships, and there may even be persecution. We'll get weary, and sometimes we'll despair, and from time to time, we may stop and ask, is this really the right path? I mean, I hear them over at Herod's place. They're having a real good party over there, lots of fun. Why don't we join them? And in response, we hear Jesus say, look around you. The deaf hear, the blind see, and the poor hear the gospel preached to them. Don't be offended. Your question's a good one, but there's an answer, and the answer is to keep doing the real thing, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed, preaching the good news to the poor. Hallelujah. If I have any sermon that I preach to you that you ever register and say, well, that's the essence of what Dan wants to tell us. There it is. If we miss on this, we miss everything. We, we, won't, we won't do any good if we bring 10,000 people on this hill every, every weekend and none of them get transformed. What's that? What, what is that? Well, it allows me to go to preacher's conference and say we've got 10,000 people meeting and then I get, I get some good gigs and make some good money talking. That'd be great. But what will I do when I face Jesus? We got a whole city out here, and, and, and the, a whole city. There are waves and waves and waves in this most church city, perhaps in America, maybe the world. We have a sea of people who are hungry for God, and they do not believe the churches are offering God. Now, they may be wrong. Maybe they, you know, they just got some kind of chip on their shoulder or something, but something has occurred in their lives that they, they don't believe we're real, they don't believe we're the real thing. Something has to change in us so that the poor come in. You know, when, when John Wesley and Charles and all the brothers, of the, there's a bunch of them, and when they, they began to work, I mean, they were, they were, you know, Oxford grads and all that that implied in, in, in England, and they started preaching, and, and poor people started coming to hear them, and, and, uh, and the poor people, you know, they, they weren't lettered and, and, and trained, and so people would shout and carry on, yell and shake and fall down on the ground. And oh, oh my, my, that shouldn't. Oh goodness, you know what do you do with the bridge party the next day when you got to like you go to that church when they're howling and carrying on like that? Like who wants to go to church like it? So they lost a lot of folks that just wasn't up for that, and they didn't like it either. Right? They were lettered people, learned people. They didn't want to identify with that stuff. And you know, after a while, the Lord did a work in their heart. You don't get to 20% of a country's population coming to work in Christ without loving them. And they loved them. And they finally thought it was preferable to be with people that fell out of trees and howled, you know, and carried on and shook when people were laying down their vices and they were coming to Christ and they were becoming educated and they were carrying the gospel. They were cleaning up their houses. Then there was a great transformation underway. They decided they'd bet, rather be connected to those kinds of people. And so would I. So, what happens? People come into a nice church like ours and somebody starts screaming out, Oh God, I'm lost. I'm going to hell. Somebody better help me. Well, I better get a psychologist for this poor woman. She's like... Beside herself, oh my, oh, my goodness, oh, something's wrong, you know, it's like people get awfully nervous. God doesn't get nervous. And what, are you, what are you going to do if, what, you, know, uh, you, know, you know the difference between a liberal and a conservative Christian in our country? A, a liberal Christian don't think the miracles happen in the Bible, and conservatives think they used to happen. 
If Jesus delivered people from evil spirits, then he still does. If he doesn't do it now, he didn't do it then. And there's, there's people, and, and, and you know, it's, I praise God, keep going to your counselor, go to your groups, keep doing all that. But if you're bound by an addiction, you're bound by darkness. You need a spiritual transformation that will break through those chains of darkness and don't stop until you get it. And if that happens in church one day, you, you ever been around with somebody that's delivered of an evil spirit? They don't say, oh my, something just went out of me. This, oh, 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 oh. We, we start having people delivered of evil spirits, and the blue hair and pearls are going to head for the doors. <laughs> How many like to see God at work? Amen. Praise God. And in the end, you've got to decide, if you want to see God at work, you don't, it doesn't matter if God shows up and we're all just struck dumb and we can't say anything, and we're here frozen in place for an hour with our mouths shut, and we can't, we can't say anything. Or whether we're just beside ourselves and we're weeping and yelling out and it sounds like a madhouse. But you know what? I don't care whichever one that happens. It doesn't matter to me. What I want to know is, do the blind see the deaf hear? Do the poor have the gospel preached to them? Are there deliverance and transformation of individuals, families, and a society in much need of God? There is no political solution to the ills of our country. There is no social solution to the ills of our country. The problems of our country are spiritual in origin and the solution is a spiritual one. I thank God for all of you that, that, that are involved in political life. We ought to be in political life, not, uh, not pull out of political life and all of that. But I can tell you one thing. Whether in political life or you're a doctor or you're a nurse or you're a psychiatrist or you're a social worker, all of these things involve fights with evil for which you need to be armed not only with some dependable ideology that you go and make sure you're Paul parroting all the ideas of your party. You need to know the power and the presence of God so you come as a help and an aid to all people regardless of political persuasion or social strata or race or national origin and you come to them armed with the words of life that Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and you have it more abundantly. This is the sign of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. 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 So let the church rise. We do things as excellently as we can. We do all the think tanks and the, and the flow charts and we do all the studies and the probability and all this. Praise God, just do it all. I'll sign it, whatever you want me to do. But at the end of the day, I want to know if Jesus is here or not. Amen. Praise God. Well, there, there's no stopping place for this. I just got to quit. <laughs> and I'm exhausted anyway. It's time to quit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tried all I could. Seemed like nothing mm, did me any good. And I heard that Jesus was passing by. So I decided I better give God a try. Oh, it is Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. Stand with me. It is Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the
deliverance of some kind right now, why don't you just come and stand right here? I need something out of my life. You say, just come and stand right here. My family's dealing with something. We got to get it out. We got to get it out. Just come right on down. It is Jesus in my soul. It is Jesus oh, in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment. And his blood and me. I sing that song to death, but just to think about that lady on her way to touch God. And that's why you're here today. Mm. Thank you, Lord. You're my healer. I believe you are all I need. I believe you're my portion, Lord. I believe that you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. We ask our prayer counselors and deacons if you'll come and stand. The Lord gives you a word for somebody. Please do that. Just don't hesitate. Come on down. Any of you just... Feel particularly called to someone. Put your hand lightly on them. Pray for them. Pray that they'll receive a deliverance right now. Comfort from God. You're my healer. I believe. I believe. I believe you are all I need. I believe you're Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold our world in your hands. Nothing. Nothing is Fatima came here after a terrible genocide in Rwanda. Her family, almost all of them, slaughtered. She came and lived here. She had lived homeless for a while. God's brought great deliverance in her life. I think very highly of her walk with God. I've asked her to dismiss, and as she does, I want us to believe that God does a work in all of our lives right here. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. When I came here, I found my destination. The first day I worked in this church, nobody invited me here, but the steps of the Lord invited me here. I sit it up there. I was crying from the beginning to the end of the service. I didn't understand why, but I felt like I arrived. And I've been... God showed me, Pastor Dan, standing here one day in my dream that with my auntie who is Muslim. And I've been praying. And there was somebody holding people on the doors. Then stopping them from coming. 
I've been praying God to open the door. We came here one time, we anointed each door here with some of the deacon here. We've been praying. God is opening Christ Church's door. Thank you, Jesus. Let's receive and be the light of this city. And we're going to be the light of this country. We praise you, Lord. Thank you. Now may the God that raised again from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, preserve you whole and blameless until the day of his coming. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine on you. May the Lord be gracious to you. Lift up your countenance and give you his peace. Now and through the ages of ages, let the people of God shout amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.